Okay, um, I'm Cliff Click. Um, I'm at least partly responsible for the stuff uh, going on. Um, I, but I'm going to, right now, today, I'm going to have a, a, a lightweight, just what is new in uh, Python, Flow, and R. On the alternate stage is what is, uh, how to get Python, R, uh, or Flow, like up and running and installed and going. So, so if you've already played with these things or you think you're you know, pretty confident, um, maybe this is what's new is a fun right talk. Um, and if you're having trouble making anything go at all, uh, maybe you wanna go next door and get the how to set it up and do the first steps. And um, is there some chance? There we go, live. Cool. Okay, so what's new? Um, uh, I'd have to say you know, the first and primary thing is we're growing fast. Um, there are a lot of new faces on the team. Um, I think we're up to 40, maybe a few more right now. Um, I, I won't go through them all, but we're a large, now larger blend of people, of you know, engineers, of math people. We have a brand new QA team. We've got you know, official HR and uh, sales and, and you know, accounting and all those things are happening. We're like a company. Um, but it still feels like, like a team, like, like we're all in the same room, in the same space, we're doing the same things together. It's a really great feel here, even with all the new faces. Okay, and then I'm gonna hit this one last time. The stickers came late in the game, so sorry if you haven't seen this before, but basically um, the stickers were an, are, are an idea and they're on the hands of the people who help people get installed to show that you got yourself installed. Um, and it's to help uh, the tutorials that come, the demos that come. If you raise your hand and you have a problem, it's like a basic installation problem, it gives a chance for the speaker to short circuit and say, hey, let's get an install helper here now um, and help this person get going. Um, in particular, uh, you're gonna need, besides H2O and Java, you're gonna need one of Python and R to do almost all the demos. Python 3 does not work right now, it's a work in progress. Um, R version 3.2.2 is recommended, but it's not required, but there is a particular version for which like read.csv was busted. Don't, if that, you have that version, it's not going to actually work for you. Okay, so I'm gonna dive into, you know, sort of what's new with H2O as a whole, because that drives a lot of what's new in Python, R, and Flow. Um, I think Arno mentioned this. We, we really did a clean overhaul of the internals of H2O. So, um, uh, you know, 14,000, almost 15,000 commits, um, big chunks of stuff were completely rewritten, and, and they were rewritten to remove technical debt. You know, we, we put together something really fast, um, we saw that it was working, we saw people got it excited and we're gonna make something happen with it, and then, you know, in the long haul, you have to come back and take those pieces and re-architect them for the future to make sure that they, they are uh, maintainable, uh, improvable, uh, uh, you know, new engineers can do stuff with them, and, and that has largely happened and been very successful as evidenced by all the new features that have been showing up. Uh, Arno mentioned a lot, I threw down a few down here. Um, all sorts of fun things like grid search, new stopping criteria, new distributions everywhere. Uh, checkpoints, you can stop model building and restart on most of the models now. Um, we have some new data sources coming online. Um, we can parse in not, not just regular strings but the UTF-8, you know, various kind of foreign characters will show up uh, in the string handling uh, things just fine now. Um, you know, GLM got beta constraints. You can specify, you know, only positive coefficient. Offsets, multinomial for G, uh, GLM. Uh, stochastic sampling for GBM. Um, NCAT's bin is how you handle too many categorical variables is what Mark Landry was talking about. He'll probably talk about that more later. A bunch of new distributions, including like Tweety and Gamma and Laplace and whatever. Uh, generalized low rank modeling with Angie. Um, it's just like this really cool algorithm for doing dimensionality reduction in a very, very intelligent way. Um, so getting rid of all the redundant data and just keeping what's uh, crucially there. And from there you can impute missing values very nicely. You can, um, uh, the, the, the more dimensionality, the reduced model, the reduced data feeds into other model modeling techniques very nicely. Uh, in particular, GLRM and deep learning uh, going together seem to be a really powerful combination. Um, and then Aaron has put together um, a, a nice way to do ensembles of models where the ensemble is strictly stronger than the, each of the individual components. Um, and I think she has a talk on that as well. So there's been a lot of improvements in the core of H2O um, all over the place. And then um, at this point, I'm going to take a look at some of the, the actual bits here. What's, I'll get my timer going. Okay, fine. 
So um, the major thing here is that we have a Python at all. Um, we started out with none at the start of the year. Um, we threw together a prototype. People loved it, people hated it, people had all these comments. Um, we tried some new experiments and how to work it. Um, some of that worked well, some of that did not. We took a lot of feedback from the Python community who jumped on it and played with it and toyed and messed around, said no, this works, yes, this doesn't, whatever. And we turned around and we cleaned it up, taken all their feedback and pretty much implemented all of it. Um, and now we have a, a fully functional Python client. It has, you know, it's parity with the R client. You can do all the things you've been able to do with R for the last year and all the new stuff you can do in Python as well. Um, here I'm showing some cuts from uh, IPython Notebook or Jupyter. Um, we have more demos coming today where people will talk about this in greater detail. Um, but definitely you have a full like development environment situation set up where Python is the core uh, tool you're driving H2O with. Um, you can do all the standard stuff you might expect. So you can load data, you can munge it, you can clean it. Um, string split, trim, trailing things, parse string, parse dates out of string columns, build new features, um, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide, log, transform, every of the can standard stuff. You can do applies. You can have functions that you apply on the entire data set written in Python. Here at the bottom, which people at the back probably can't see, I've just done mean of the squares minus square of the means, standard deviation. There's a line down there that says, uh, uh, have an abstract function that's just doing square column and sum it. Um, put into a, a, an apply call there. Um, data can come in from all the places uh, that H2O normally takes data from. CSV files on your local laptops, that'll be the demos today. HDFS, NFS, Hive, we can read Hive files directly. S3, um, ORC's coming. Uh, in fact, probably by the end of this week, we'll have uh, Master Bleeding Edge, we'll have ORC. Um, Python objects. You can go back and forth between H2 and Python if your data is small enough to fit on your, in your Python uh, workspace. You can just take a Python array and shove it to H2O and do machine learning and shove the results back or whichever way you want to go with that. Um, a full set of Pythonic column and row selectors. So we started out with being more R-like and more pandas-like, but uh, most of the Python community said, no, we like Python as Python. So it's very Pythonic. Um, Select columns by name, by index. Negative index does what Python does. It means get a column from the end. Do slicing in both rows and columns, any two-dimensional rectangular grid thing with strides. Um, do lists of columns or rows. Filter by uh, arbitrary expressions. So you can say all, here I have one that's a, all rows where the first column is greater than a half, do something. Um, the next one down is, you know, I can assign, the same way as I can do a git. Um, and then at the bottom, which again, the people at the bottom can't see, I'm doing list comprehension, where I can put a data frame and a for loop, put a list comprehension around it, and it does the obvious right thing. So I can go write my Python code like I'm talking about a Python data frame, a Python list or array or whatever it is, and it will turn into standard everyday Python behavior, but running on H2O on big data. So you could have a terabyte in the cluster and be writing your Python code, and it's interactive. It, it feels like you're at a console and you're just typing away. Um, we've gone the next step. This is my, my hacked up pipeline display that I didn't get how I wanted it to look like. But basically, um, you can build full scikit style pipelines um, with all kinds of complex munging and string ops as I mentioned before, you might have some log files, you're gonna string split on some column separator, you're gonna take some column pieces and trim white space and lower uppercase and turn them into a categorical. And the next one you might do a date conversion and the next one you might just parse numbers out or however it's done. You can do joins, um, big joins. I got a uh, slide on that coming up where you might pull in data from a couple different sources and start lining up your columns on billions and billions of rows. Um, you can split rapidly in group buys. Maybe you want to do imputation on each individual subgrouping for whatever complicated grouping you've got going on, um, or trim outliers according to how the groups are broken out to whatever categorical thing you're grouping on. And you can put all these things together and then train a standard H2O model from it and turn that into a plain old Java object, which has all the data munging features built into the pipeline. So you get a piece of Java code out that you can plug into a Stormbolt, Java app, any web server, um, all kind of place, Spark streaming, 
and it will include the data munging that's necessary to feed into the model so that your predictions include the munging features. So you can take the raw source data, wherever it's coming from, push it at that POJO, it's gonna do all the data, slice, split, as date parse, you know, uh, trim, white space, whatever you had going on, and then turn those into the raw values that go into the model and you get a prediction out. So that talk's coming up at 11, 11.30, and tomorrow Hank's also gonna have another talk. So, so we had a couple uh, talks on using Python uh, and heading for Python in production and the kinds of cool stuff you can do with these pipelines. Okay, one of the, the big, big sore points we had with uh, R and that we, we've rescued it for both Python and R was big data, big temps. And the problem is simply you have a long running loop doing something that you're gonna put probably in production and you're gonna have it run every day on a regular basis. Maybe you're constantly building a large set of models. You have some complicated feature munging going on. You're building lots and lots of temps while you're doing this complicated feature munging. Well, if you've got big data, you have big temps. And after a while, you run out of memory and you have to do something about these temps and, and clean them out on a regular basis. So we've gotten figured out how to do all the temp reclamation um, for you. Basically, it's managed by the Python client using Python's ref counting. So when whatever function you have exits, whenever whatever uh, a lexical scope ends, the Python does this ref counting thing, he calls his finalizer, and will clean out all the temps that are dead at that point. So you won't need to do uh, what do I have left alive at the end of my loop that I need to clean out so it can fit into my next loop. It'll all get cleaned out for you. Um, the, you can fine tune, control it. Any object that you put a name on yourself will have that name in the cluster and that won't go away. That's yours now and you have to remove it yourself. Um, and that will be true of all things like uh, any loaded data, um, models built, or anything that you've done a, you know, an assign a name to, those will stick around till you explicitly remove them. Um, w with this data management, the temps getting deleted sort of behind your back, we're still having full standard Python reference semantics. So you're gonna pass around an H2O data frame into a function and out again, you make mutations and changes it. That behavior will act as if you handed in a Python object and made changes to it and you know, a Python array and updated it and munged features or whatever and, and passed it back out. Standard Pythonic reference semantics. It's crucial I say that because in the R slide it's gonna be different. It's gonna be R standard semantics. This is all backed by uh, uh, optimization in the back end doing copy on write. Um, and what that really means is that a big data copy is free unless you actually change something. So it's actually not getting copied. There's a little pointer counting saying, hey, we're sharing this piece of data. And if you touch it, if you write to it, that's a modification. We'll make a copy on the right, and then you modify the copy. But if you don't actually copy the data, you just want the semantics, it's free to make a copy. Um, and so we did this uh, uh, in part for the R people. We've had some fairly aggressive R uh, script people. Uh, I think I can say market share has been doing some large, heavyweight data munging model building operations for which they had issues with temp management. And the R side, the reference counting doesn't make sense. We're using RGC to flush extra temps. And so running an RGC cycle periodically will clean out all the temps. Um, you might have to force that along because in typical, typically your R session doesn't have the big data now, so you're not making a lot of data in R, so R isn't running out of memory, so R won't run a GC cycle. So you might have to force it along to help the cluster remove memory. Um, but here, my little loop on the right here, uh, I'm showing, I just threw a GC in the loop somewhere, and that's gonna clean out the extra temps on the, in the cluster. Um, again, uh, user named objects, loaded data sets, models are all explicit user managed. You're gonna have to remove those directly. You can do an LS to get the names and decide what you wanna keep and remove. All these things, by the way, are all visible in Flow um, the, from the web page, so you can see what models you've got loaded and what data sets you've got loaded and how they're named. Um, you can also find the temps in Flow, but they'll disappear behind your back the next time a GC cycle runs. Okay, and then the other, the other big news here is that um, we have full R copy by value semantics for these arrays, the way R users both love and hate. Um, you're passing along a large value, you pass it to a function, you make a mutation on it, you return from the function, your big array goes back to the way it was because it's passed by value. And, and we're preserving those full semantics. 
We're making it cheap by doing this copy and write optimization in the back end. So it's all free to make these copies unless you actually change something in an interesting way. So, um, so I'm gonna say this is new and it's, it is and it isn't. Rapids is our next generation of how we talk programs to the back end, how Python and R describe a program that goes shipped over a REST call as a URL string. So we have to take your program, whatever you've done in Python and R, and turn it into some sort of string that goes over the wire, and then you get an answer back saying I did this computation. Well that string we call Rapids, and it's a simple Lisp-like syntax. It has full first class functions, it has, um, you know, very straightforward Lispy notation. Um, it's passed by value semantics everywhere, um, but optimized for bulk array operations. And that optimization, the big piece of that is this copy and write hack here at the bottom. And if you're interested and you got a systems hacker head, um, you know, meet me in, I think it's the bull room this afternoon, we'll have a hacker session, and I'll explain what copy and write means. But in the terms of the, you know, systems engineers, it's typically called cow. So there's my confused cow down there. The, um, the main thing to think about is that the lifetimes of all your temps are managed by your, your, each of your different clients for either Python or R. And whenever that client declares the temporary variable to go out of scope, that's when the data can, can be reclaimed on the server. So if you have a variable, you say X equals some random expression and you forgot about X, well X is still alive, that value is still available, it's still alive on the server. You sign X to null in R, or you sign it to none in Python or whatever, it's now dead, then the server can reclaim it. And, and so there, you know, the management's done by the client, owns the lifetime of that data. Um, the other big news in Rapids, um, besides the general expansion of all the things that it does, is that we're getting big join and big sort figured out. Um, it's, it's in a side branch now, but it's coming along nicely, and we're hoping to push it into Bleeding Edge Master within, say, a month. Um, when I say big join, I mean joins on data sets that are too big to fit on one machine. So the, both the input sets and the output results are too big to fit on one machine. And we're seeing numbers like a billion uh, uh, rows by five columns grouped with a billion. So this is a join of a billion things being done in about half the time of data.table. And this is Matt Dow of data.table doing this hacking now in Java. Um, and he's got it basically parallel. Um, and we're seeing interesting speed ups. And interesting more speed ups when you go distributed. <clears throat> and we're busy testing on 10 billions by 10 billions. Um, and this is only gonna go up. So we are going to have the world's fastest uh, join and group by operation here before long. Um, it's the standard data.table sort. So it will, it's also a sort. So we're gonna have a big, giant, fast sort. It's, once you've got a sort, you have an index, you can do binary search lookups on individual values by ranges, by whatever your sort keys are. Um, you can do a rolling join. Rolling joins are, uh, you know, the last observation carried forward kind of join. It's, um, you know, if I have uh, something like a, like a, a, a commercial advertisement event that I'm running, and then separately I see sales, and these are not necessarily correlated, but presumably the commercial drives the sale. I want to take maybe the last commercial that happened before the sale as those are correlated. And, and they might be different places in time and there's no unique ID you're lining them up. So you just take when's the last time something happened here to when this other thing happened here. And that's the rolling join. It's used in the financial world a lot to look at events in the world compared to like stock purchase, purchases on billions and billions of transactions. So um, rolling joins, it's coming. Um, other improvements I mentioned, I showed you Python taking a lambda expression. You can run that per column or per row. Um, basically we've beefed up Rapids to handle sort of any arbitrary lambda expression in a lot of new contexts. In particular, um, you can do group buys on billions and billions. So you might have, you know, trillions of rows turning into billions of group buys and run some lambda function on billions of individual groups. And that's, that's working. I mean, working on the one billions now and we'll have it working on, you know, tens of billions here uh, soon enough. Um, flow, it, 
I was thinking I was gonna show what's new in Flow, but actually Flow's almost brand new this last year. Um, I think we were announcing it at last H2O World. Flow is this really slick, notebook style, um, you know, browser-based uh, tool for driving H2O. Um, it's, it's a notebook style, you can put in commentary and text to describe the story that you're building, um, but you can have steps in there that are executable, just like an IPython notebook where I said, load some data, do this munging, drop these columns, do imputation of the mean or the mode or whatever, build my models, build more models, compare them, line them up, do predictions, whatever, the whole nine yards of, of what you can do. Um, it's all available in Flow, and in, in you know, more recent memory, things that have happened here, um, confusion matrices as a graphical thing pop out, uh, ROC curves are now completely available, so you know, if you've built a model in R or Python, you can go to Flow and get your ROC curve like popped right out that way as well. Um, you can see your plain old Java code come out just so you can take a look in, at what the thing's doing for your Java code. Um, grid search is available now from Flow. Um, you can import and export models so that you can save your models to disk and share them with your friends and then pull them back in. Um, you can, at the time that you load data, you might want to change column types. If the internal parser is guessing the wrong type, you can go column by column and pick what type you want. And that becomes part of the flow, which is a, a savable thing. You, know, you can save and load those flows, but if you know you have a data set that's got a particular column layout, you can go pick what types or what columns and, and tell it at the time you pull the data in. Um, you can do imputation, splitting frames. There's a lot of cluster diagnostics built in now. Cluster status, get your log files, do a profiler of what h is doing. You can get stack traces of where all the threads are running. Um, network, performance tests, memory checks, things like that. Um, there's been a lot of work in Flow to improve its speed for very wide columns. So I think a year ago I was saying that we were sort of reliably good at 1,000 and things kind of clunked along at 10,000 columns, I, I'm gonna say now we're reliably good at 10,000 columns. And things kind of get clunky at 100,000, there's issues at 100,000 columns. But 10,000 definitely works. And definitely you can look at it in flow and screw around and pan and do all kinds of fun stuff there. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna say about what's new is what's not new. So we're still committed to producing the fastest, bestest, biggest, baddest machine learning on the planet. Quality, size, scale, speed, it's all there. Billions by billions joins, grid search, new algorithms, new data sources, new all kinds of stuff. Um, rapid pace of innovation, of innovation, tons and tons of new code, about 15,000 commits on H203, not counting the time before that in H202 that got rolled in H203. So we're, we're one of the fastest moving open source projects on the planet, and we are producing, you know, new functionality at a super high rate. Um, the culture internally really is one of people who care about what the code is, what it does, how it works, what's the user experience, how do we make your life better, that you can take this and, and, and save the world. Do your good stuff and make the world a better place for everybody. It's a bigger team, there are a lot of new faces, but everyone's just as pumped about doing it right, doing the right thing for the right reason. So we are, we are as ever committed to producing you know, the best stuff on the planet for everyone to use. It's about community, culture, and code. And, and that's it. Thank you. So I have a few minutes for questions. see some hands, oh, here you go. Uh, do you know when uh, interaction terms will be available through H2O Flow? Through Flow, I thought interactive terms was available through Flow, do you know if it's like, not? It's not yet? I know it's available in through R and I think through Python as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's available through the packages, but I was wondering if there's a way to import and then do a uh, poly expansion using multiple degrees and stuff, just without any scripting. Right, um, I don't know off the top of my head. I will go find out though. Um, like I said, as far as I knew, it was, it was available. I know it's completely available in the back end. A couple questions there, yeah. <laughs> the hands raised and we're not actually got a question.
Is there going to be PML support for model exports for H2O? PMML support? Yes. Unfortunately, PMML is not really an open standard. Um, and so there's not a, a good way to, uh, uh, well, there's two issues. One is because it's not open, you have to get permission, um, which was not forthcoming. We tried about two years ago and didn't get it. Uh, the other thing is that it doesn't have um, like a JDK style set of tests that you would use to validate the, uh, the results of the model that were, that would be described correctly. So I, I don't know that it's, um, it's useful as a model exportation because you would then import it into some other tool and you would expect the semantics to stay the same and there's no JCK style or TCK style testing to validate that. Like I don't know what the semantics of PMM are if I write something out and then it gets loaded into some other tool, how they're going to interpret what I wrote. That requires like a pretty high level effort of testing um, with the intent of supporting external tools and as I said, that hasn't seemed to have been forthcoming. So at this time, we're not doing PMML. If those things change, we could do it. We at one time put together a PMML, you know, importer and writer that's easy enough to do, um, but we need sort of rigorous testing, otherwise you won't get the same answer on different tools. You know, how do you handle NA? How do you handle uh, uh, round off error or extreme outliers and stuff? There's a bunch of funny issues that all have to be very carefully nitpicked down or your models will behave differently. And then the other one was simply, we couldn't get permission, we asked. Seeing a question in the back. <laughs> no, okay. You wanna? Mark started supporting PMMLs. Uh, that's one. Uh, another wait. question related is uh, lib SVM format. Do you support import of those files? Um, we support SVM light. Okay, it's being like, Directly, okay. yes. Okay. And in Thanks. fact, we'll, we'll inhale it and keep it sparse inhaled and have it sparsely in H2O. <coughs> it, won't, it won't blow up on import. You, you wanna, okay. Oh, we have one more. So, um, I saw your, um, um, Data table will be your basically your core interface towards distributed tables, and will you keep the uh, will the semantics still the same on how to use the data table in R? So we're going to um, at this point we're going to use uh, an an interface that looks like H two O standard interface. Um, the what goes on in data table that's different from what goes on in R is actually fairly small. Um, in terms of, of how you select things. If that turns out to be interesting, we can put in a data table full semantics wrapper. Um, it doesn't make sense for Python, but Python will have full access to this as well. So really we're gonna look for a clean way to specify uh, joins and functions that are run on, uh, on the big groupings that you know, data tables sort of known for. Um, and then how the syntax comes out is sort of work in progress still for the R client. It may not be identical. So repeat, please, or I'll repeat. So any future support for Scala. So um, Scala is uh, a basically a full-fledged client by now. Um, we have been doing uh, uh, sparkling water for a while, and sparkling water is, of course, is H2O and, and Spark, but Spark Scala. So it's really H2O and Scala. Um, you can do all those things that you can do in Java, you can do in Scala directly. Um, if you have sparkling water, then you get the RDDs support the full pipeline with Spark stuff. But if you just want to do Scala as a way to drive H2O, you can do that now. It's, it's a full client. Flow will drive H2O. You cannot drive Scala from Flow. You drive, Flow drives the backend via a, a REST API call. It's the same as Python and R. I have one more, and then I gotta, I gotta get off. Yeah, any plans to support uh, native code like your, you know, compiling to Go? You know, like TensorFlow is Google with TensorFlow. I'm sorry, any native support? My question is, uh, are you so so currently you're supporting VMs, or, 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 uh, um, Java, and so on? Are you planning to support uh, native code compilation, like you know that you can do this in Go? Um, no, 
So we, we are finding the performance of Java is good enough that we don't care to change our implementation language for some other boost in performance. Um, we're strictly using Java because we can code faster and get stuff done, and, and the performance is clearly fast enough. I mean, we're beating everyone else by a long shot if they're doing sort of just core basic stuff. Um, there are a few places where we might pull in bits and pieces of uh, native code for things, but that would be hidden internally, called from Java, and strictly used to drive like certain algorithms faster. So the obvious one would be deep learning might want to use GPUs. And less obvious, but actually right on the edge is whether or not you want to take Blas libraries for dense linear algebra. We do pretty well, but Blas does a little bit better, so we could pull in Blas to, to clean up or speed up a few things in the dense linear algebra realm. Other than that, we don't have any plans for doing any implementation uh, outside of Java. If you're looking to write new algorithms, um, you can write them yourselves and call Java, enter call, you know, the, the JVM, the, it's a fully embeddable in other pieces of, of work. You can take H2O and embed it in your own application any way you like. As long as you can call out to a Java process, um, works fine. Okay, and that, I think I need to yep. let somebody else go. It's well, so actually we're gonna, it's now the refreshment break. So uh, time for coffee, take a break, stretch your legs. And then we'll be back here at 10.45. Tomash will actually be giving a talk on generalized linear modeling.